Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm very glad to see such a great crowd here today for uh, Professor Joe Singer's latest book, a talk with uh, him and several of his colleagues here from the Harvard Law School. I'm Suzanne Wunz. I'm the executive director of the Harvard Law School Library. And uh, I just wanted to point out, in addition to today's delicious lunch, which we'd like to thank the Dean's Office for, there's also copies of the book for sale here from the Coop. And the title, of course, is No Freedom Without Regulation, The Hidden Lesson of the Subprime Crisis, which is a bit of a spoiler, but uh, we'll hear more about that. <laughs> so I'll just very quickly introduce our author and panelists. Of course, our author is Professor Joe Singer, who's the Busey Professor of Law. Uh, he also has with him here today John Goldberg, the Eli Goldston Professor of Law, Todd Rakoff, the Byrne Professor of Administrative Law, Kenneth Mack, the Lawrence D. Beale Professor of Law, Chris Dasan, the Leo Gottlieb Professor of Law, and Henry Smith, the Fessenden Professor of Law and Director of the Project on the Foundations of Private Law. So, Professor Singer, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you all for coming. My whole uh, premise of the book is in the title. Um, and whether you read it forwards or backwards, <laughs> forwards is no freedom without regulation, the hidden lesson of the subprime crisis, read it backwards, the hidden lesson of the subprime crisis is no freedom without regulation. Um, I, for a long time, I've been um, uh, thinking about the fact that Americans hate regulation. Um, and think of it as this oppressive thing that interferes with their freedom. And then looking around, and we have an awful lot of regulations. And if people really hated them that much, we actually could get rid of them. So there's this oddity about people saying they hate regulation, but actually demanding it. Um, and then thinking analytically about it, uh, regulations are just laws. And Americans hate regulation, but they like the rule of law. And I, that either means people are very confused, or they have some very sophisticated <coughs> distinction between regulation and law. Maybe regulation just means laws we don't like. Um, but the subprime crisis gave me an occasion to uh, make the argument that um, uh, markets and property don't function without rules. And that means they don't function without law. That means they don't function without regulation. Uh, if you say that you like the free market and you don't like government, uh, that is actually an incoherent statement because there's no such thing as a market without law. Same thing's true for private property. And we talk this way, um, not only in general, in the public, but academics talk this way. My colleagues often talk about market solutions versus government solutions. Um, I hear people talking about when should we intervene in the market and when should we leave the market alone. Uh, from my standpoint, the idea of leaving the market alone uh, means not having a market. There's no such thing as leaving the market alone. Uh, markets have rules. Um, uh, and same thing true is, uh, is true with freedom. Uh, John Locke is a libertarian hero, but he's the one who said, where there is no law, there is no freedom. Freedom uh, uh, tends to mean for people uh, freedom of action, the freedom to do what you want without restraint. But when we think about living in a free society, we actually don't imagine a society with no government. Uh, there are places in the world that don't have functioning governments, and I, for one, don't really want to live there. Uh, freedom is not anarchy. Freedom is living within uh, a just legal structure. And freedom to us also, I think, um, means democracy. Uh, freedom means not only having markets and property, it also means government by the people, uh, of the people, and for the people. Uh, so freedom seems to mean having um, good rules, not having no rules. The subprime crisis gave me an occasion for um, uh, uh, trying to explain this, uh, partly because I was very confused about it, how the subprime crisis actually happened. Uh, people were sold mortgages that they could not afford to pay back. In my day, back when I was young, bankers were very conservative um, and cautious, and bankers would never lend anyone money that they couldn't pay back. It just struck me as 
very strange that they were lending money to people that couldn't pay it back. And I wanted to figure out why they were doing that. Um, they basically would loan the money and uh, in that process, I think there was a lot of deception that went on. Um, people were told, look, um, you can pay a, a rate that's affordable. In two years, it'll go up, and I know you won't be able to afford that higher rate, but you can just refinance. So I think a lot of people got the subprime mortgages under the idea that they could refinance, but no one told them that if the market price of property went down, they wouldn't be able to refinance. And they'd lose everything, and they'd be worse off than before. Um, I think there was a lot of deception that happened that led people to get the mortgages. Uh, when the mortgages were securitized, uh, the rating agencies gave them AAA ratings. We, AAA used to mean safe, right? But the rating agencies basically changed the meaning to uh, the mortgages are the ones that they say are in the package, right? Which is like as is. That is, so AAA didn't mean safe anymore. It meant um, if these are bad mortgages, you're getting bad mortgages. If they're good ones, you're getting good ones. Um, but a lot of Pension funds and cities bought securitized subprime mortgages because they were rated AAA. I think there was uh, fraud or quasi-fraud of those investors as well as the consumers. So I was trying to figure out how this happened, and there was inadequate regulation. That's part of what happened. Um, and trying to think about why people uh, uh, don't like regulation, our, our image of it is that Regulation is like a yoke on your back. It's like a, um, a backpack that you're carrying around that has four very heavy, thick law books in it. Uh, and it's just weighing you down. Um, but my conception of regulation is that there are some regulations like that. I'm not saying all regulations are good. But I think of most regulation as the floor that we stand on. The regulation actually um, lets us get what we want when we go into the marketplace. Um, we, uh, um, uh, consumer protection law protects us from deception, protects us from unfair practices, uh, and it lets us bargain about other things. So I think of consumer protection law and a lot of regulatory laws as actually helping us get what we want rather than taking away um, our freedom. The same thing's true about uh, thinking about laws through the, the lens of democracy. We tend to think about the marketplace and private properties where we exercise liberty. And laws limit our liberty by coercing us to act in certain ways or not to act in certain ways. <clears throat> what I find strange about that is I'm a political philosopher, and in a democracy we elect people. <clears throat> Those people pass laws. We don't like the laws. We can vote the officials out, and they can get rid of those laws. Now, I know there's a lot of defects in our political process, and money affects politics, but <clears throat> there's a lot of laws that we have that people could get rid of if they wanted to. We exercise choice when we go into the marketplace. We exercise choice when we use our property. We also exercise choice when we vote, and we vote for people that pass laws. We have a lot of regulation because Americans want regulation. There's a lot of talk now about you know, whether environmental law is going too far, I don't hear any of the candidates for president campaigning to repeal the Clean Water Act. They may not like certain regulations, may think certain things go far. No one's saying we should have no environmental regulation. I don't hear people saying we should repeal consumer protection laws. I don't hear people saying we should repeal zoning law. I don't hear people saying we should repeal any discrimination law, workplace safety law. All these regulations, uh, regulations of banks, all of that kind of stuff, People, we have regulations because people want them. They help us get what we want rather than interfering with what we want. Um, uh, so I, I think I'll stop there. We have a lot of people on the uh, panel, and they have things to say, and I want to make sure they have enough time to say them. So, um, Thanks, Joe, and thanks, everyone, uh, for coming, and thanks to the library for organizing uh, this wonderful occasion. Um, and congratulations in particular to Joe for the publication of this uh, lovely book. Um, it's really quite a remarkable book. It covers um, an incredible range of topics, everything from feudalism to the subprime crisis, uh, and does so in a way that is uh, accessible, engaging, and often quite funny. 
uh, and comes in under 200 pages. Um, <laughs> that, I think, is an incredible achievement of which I am very jealous. Um, uh, one of the things I most like about the book is that it's written uh, by an academic with fancy academic credentials and is quite sophisticated, but aims for and is quite capable of reaching a broader audience. And I hope it does, because Joe has uh, a very important message to deliver, and the message is the one he just said, which is that our contemporary political and legal discourse has become captive to a simplistic idea, a slogan, so to speak. Uh, and the problem is not only with the people who propagate the slogan, but also those who respond to it on its own terms. Uh, according to this slogan, government and freedom are polar opposites. Whenever one is present, the other is absent. They crowd each other out. In short, the slogan reads as follows. Where there is more government, there is less freedom. Where there is less government, there is more freedom. Joe's basic point, made with an array of illustrations ranging from the subprime crisis itself to land use regulation to consumer protection, is that this way of talking, regardless of whether one is on the side of more government or more freedom, this way of talking is, quote unquote, subprime i.e. disastrous. It's really quite a lovely turn of phrase. Um, uh, it is disastrous because, catchy though it may be, it is false. Insofar as we rely on this simple binary opposition between government and freedom, we cannot hope to make reasonable decisions about important questions of government regulation. Why is the slogan false? Well, because as Joe very carefully points out, government regulation and law is in many instances what makes freedom possible. Uh, government and law, after all, he says, are responsible for freeing up property to be owned and transferred rather than held in perpetuity by the state or by a feudal lord and his descendants. They also play a large role in keep, keeping us from beating and robbing each other, and they enhance the ability of ordinary people to engage in commerce, not only by prohibiting and punishing fraud, but by regulating the kinds of terms that can appear in standard form contracts. So once we see that government and freedom uh, is not a binary, Joe argues we can actually have the conversation we need to have. We will not be fighting about whether government is good or bad or whether we like or don't like freedom. We will be fighting about which regulations are desirable for a free and democratic society. Now, as Joe endearingly admits in his conclusion, he is an optimist, quote unquote. He believes that if we can just take the blinders off, and get out of the cave, so to speak, we will have a basis for greater mutual understanding and less divisive politics. I like to think of myself as an optimist as well, though here I think Joe has outdone me. Um, uh, my relative pessimism owes something to the current political climate and the institutions that seem to thrive on its polarization. Uh, but more saliently to the current discussion is also fueled by a question or perhaps a qualm about Joe's central thesis. Another way of saying this is now comes the part where I mean to my colleague. Um, <laughs> a grumpy way to put the qualm is as follows. Uh, Joe's analysis runs together some concepts that probably need to be pulled apart. At times, at least, he treats government, regulation, and law as interchangeable. He does the same, I think, for concepts of freedom, democracy, and equality. Now, there's a justification for doing some of this. As I noted at the outset, this is a book intended for a broad audience, not for a handful of analytic philosophers. Even so, the running together of these concepts probably allows him to avoid various problems that, when acknowledged, stand to limit the reach of his argument and in that way dampen the prospects that it will provide the basis for mutual understanding and a greater degree of political convergence. And let me be a little more concrete about that last point, and then I'll stop. It is one thing to say that even the most strident libertarians should value some government, some laws, and some regulations. It is another to say that if you value those things, you are committed to recognizing the validity of a welfare state, or laws that heavily regulate consumer transactions, or regulations that prevent landlords from evicting non-paying -paying tenants or that call for public funds to be used to ensure that anyone who wants to be a homeowner can be. To be clear, my point is not that the policies I just described are bad. My point is instead that one can cogently criticize these policies while still conceding the contribution of government and regulation and law to freedom. In sum, while it is true enough that there is no freedom without regulation, and that's a very important lesson of this book, I worry that the recognition of this truth may not get us as far as Joe would hope. 
It is indeed incoherent for libertarians to rail against government, full stop. It is not incoherent, though perhaps misguided, for libertarians to complain that laws protecting consumers and tenants or redistributing income or properties unduly interfere with their freedom. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> one of the terrific things about this book uh, that uh, we forget about is how much of our current legal situation and the way we formulate things is the result of, his, of a historical process of uh, getting rid of feudalism and getting rid of slavery. And uh, I, I'm really amazed at how much you, were, Joe, was able to get out of anti-feudalism as a, a I mean, a, the, the idea that laissez-faire is not just leave your hands off things and let the market roll, but in fact was a fighting creed that was, that was using government to get rid of uh, restrictions on what jobs you could take, restrictions on how much your bread could cost restrictions on where you could live, restrictions on who could come onto your property and so forth, that uh, behind what we view as sort of neutral government, in fact, is the fighting use of government to get to that state is really a terrific part of the book, and I, I, I guess my favorite part of the book. Um, but like, like Professor Goldberg, I want to raise a question about, about the book. Um, and <clears throat> Uh, it'll take me a minute to get there. So Joe's uh, theory is that he, he takes the conservative phrase, no freedom without law, and he just essentially says that's equivalent to the phrase, no freedom without regulation. That there's no inherent difference between law and regulation it's all a question, a much more contextual question of what the effects of the law are and how it's used. Um, <clears throat> another way of phrasing that would be to say that there's no presumptive set of legal doctrines which more adequately define freedom than any other set of legal doctrines, that we have to consider it doctrine by doctrine and point by point whether this doctrine enhances freedom or uh, decreases, decreases freedom. Um, so now, if I think about that as a, in terms of teaching the first year of Harvard Law School, so uh, which you know some of you have been through, the, some of you obviously are not first year students, but um, so I teach, uh, the four, student, the four courses that my students have are civil procedure, property, contracts, and legislation and regulation. Now, putting civil procedure to one side is a weird subject that nobody understands. Uh, uh, the way Joe sets it up um, would be that, that the property teaching, teacher is teaching the law of the market, the contracts teacher is teaching the law of the market, and I am teaching what's called legislation and regulation. I am teaching the law of the market. And that we're all teaching, uh, philosophically speaking, equivalent subjects, although historically and institutionally, they focus on different pieces of the, different pieces of the subject. And um, I'm just wondering whether that's true. Uh, I mean, that would be saying that what we call regulation or legislation and regulation is different because it's, it comes uh, out of a politically elected group of people as opposed to out of judges uh, or saying because it's um, <coughs> uh, federal law superimposed on what's primarily state law or because it's done by uh, executive branch officials <laughs> Uh, rather than Article One or Article Three officials, and I, I think the cries against regulation in the in the press have all those pieces have all those institutional pieces part of it. But the question that remains is: Does the uh, 
common law, the, what is the primary subject that the contracts and property teachers are teaching, does that law have a claim to representing to correctly representing the starting point for thinking about what freedom is? Or is it simply uh, one view that's no better or worse than any other, than any other view? Uh, I don't know the answer to that subject. I think the way our curriculum is set up replicates what Joe thinks is wrong. Uh, that is to say, it presumptively says that contracts and property teachers are teaching something which is primary, and then regulation is kind of being superimposed on, on, on top. I don't mean the way Joe teaches it himself, but, uh, but anyway, that's that's that seems to me to be the question that I, uh, I honestly don't know how I stand on, but just as a way of thinking about what is at stake in what he's, in what he's saying. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to thank Joe for writing such an informative and provocative book. Um, what I said to him earlier is, you know, I, I teach property. Um, I don't think that I, I hope that I'm not teaching that this particular subject is primary or a repository of freedom in a way that what we conceive of as regulation is not. And what really buttresses my hope is the structure of Joe's casebook, which is what I teach from. And what I said to Joe before we got started was um, what this book is really about is kind of everything that I teach in my property class or kind of everything that's in Joe's casebook applied to the financial crisis and to the current debate we're having about regulation. So, you know, when I think about it that way, I think, I hope, I don't know, um, that the message that at least those who use Joe's casebook send to their students is that, um, is, is the hope that the way Todd just formulated the problem is not correct, but then again, um, it's only a hope. Um, let me say two things about Joe's book. One is to echo what lots of other folks have said, um, but to kind of end on, I think, in a different place. Um, I think um, both John and Todd have said in one way or another um, that we are capable of distinguishing between law and regulation, um, or that there are arguments that might be made against Curtain regulatory proposals that sound in freedom, but they're able to separate law from regulation. And let me cash it out a couple of different ways. One, um, there's lots of people, there's lots of ways to distinguish between private law, which is what we traditionally mostly taught in the first year curriculum, and regulation. One of them was basically the framework that um, nowadays goes under the name of Lochner, a substantive due process which meant that you, know, you could concede that contract was regulation, but maybe the authors of substantive due process where they went wrong, or were actually to actually take their worldview, um, what they thought they were doing was that you know, there was a version of contract that sounded in freedom, and there was a version of contract that sounded in something else, coercion, and they were protecting the version of contract that sounded in freedom. Meaning they could all, they could basically concede that it was all regulation from top to bottom, but some regulation was freedom sounding and other regulation was not. Ronald Coase is another version of this. You know, the standard interpretation of Coase's argument is that in an environment of low transaction costs, we should pick clear rules because clear rules enhance freedom because it enables us to uh, essentially exchange things and get what we want. Um, so, you know, you could sort of do the Coasean framework and, you know, you can't read Coase without understanding that Coase is saying very clearly, even the, the kind of popularized interpretation of Coase is saying very clearly 
um, that there's no world without regulation, but that we can distinguish regulations that enhance autonomy and freedom from those that don't. Um, so there's a bunch of other ways of making that argument. So I, don't, I won't sort of keep, keep going. Um, but the point is, is pretty clear. Um, there's lots of ways to distinguish between law and regulation, and perhaps critics of regulation are um, criticizing a particular kind of regulation that they think is inconsistent with freedom, but they would concede that it's all regulation. Um, okay. Let me say one thing about the financial crisis, and then I'll um, come back to where I began. Um, yeah. Um, well, no, no, no. no. Let, let me go just to kind of where I'm going to end. Um, and it, it, it's complicated. Uh, the the question, question for Joe's book is, sir, who are you arguing with? It seems to me that you are absolutely right to set up the problem the way you are in the sense that we've come to a point where our debate about regulation has become debased, uh, has become simplistic, uh, has become, dare I say, ignorant. Um, and sort of what I think John and Todd have said so far, and probably what Chris and Henry are gonna say, <laughs> is that there are ways of kind of having that debate in a much more sophisticated way. But we don't have that debate in a much more sophisticated way. So, you know, I might see this book as kind of opening up room for that kind of debate. Mm -hmm. um, when we, you know, what I teach in my sort of history of economic regulation course is sort of why did certain kinds of New Deal and post New Deal regulations come to be seen as coercive in the 1970s? And there's lots of people had criticisms of regulation circa 1975. And they were real criticisms. I mean, they might have been right or they might have been wrong, but they were real criticisms. And some of them were relatively sophisticated. But where we seem to have come to is this sort of debased discourse about regulation that I think Joe rightly takes on. And you know, you might think of this book as clearing out some dead wood so that we can have a really robust debate about what kind of regulatory regime we should have. Okay, last point, really kind of last point. Um, you know, again, audience. Um, who is Joe's audience? Um, maybe liberals or people who are inclined to favor certain kinds of regulation as making the world better and trying to make their arguments better. Maybe uh, people on the other side who are hostile to what they view as regulation. Um, but when I kind of think, you know, your, your, your opponents really are people who have been shaped by this debate about the Tea Party. Um, and we have to kind of understand that the Tea Party emerged in a, in a couple of different contexts, one of which is the, um, you know, the bank bailouts, second of which was um, the question of whether or not people who were kind of underwater should get relief on their mortgages. But the third is that it emerged in the context of uh, a bunch of proposals that were put forward by the first African-American president. Um, and at least part of the debate that we're having, you know, there, there is a rational debate, which is about its regulation versus government. It's about this and about that. But a lot of it is about kind of what gets conjured up in the minds of opponents of regulation when they think of regulation. And what gets conjured up in their minds, I think, is redistribution, um, coercion, and uh, a bunch of people getting something that they shouldn't deserve. Meaning, you know, even if we kind of cleared away the dead wood and we got back to a robust argument about what is regulation, what is freedom, you know, is the other cultural baggage that attaches itself to this debate, this debate so great um, that we really couldn't have that debate? And I'd like to be, at the end of the day, an optimist about that question, but I think the answer to that question is not entirely clear. So uh, it's a pleasure to participate, and I add my congratulations to Joe.
uh, for this magnificent book. And I'm going to say why I'm congratulating him. I want to talk about two of the major contributions of the book first. And then from those accomplishments, I want to draw a few questions to, to pose Joe. Um, a first major contribution, and I'm glad nobody said this because I get to say it. This book is just a feast of critical legal thinking. It's a real, um, Joe, it's a, it's a delight to read. Joe is quite simply a master of legal realism and of critical legal thought. And uh, the whole toolbox is on display. So let me, let me spell that out with a few examples. Technique number one, exposing hidden baselines. So Joe will say something like, you know, conservative thinkers aren't actually anti-regulation. Rather, they're assuming the kinds of regulations or they're assuming the rule of law conditions that make markets possible. So, so when, you, when they talk about government as imposition, they're actually assuming the law that keeps them free from thieves. They're assuming laws against malicious use of property that would start a fire on one property and have it spread to other properties. And he makes this great analogy here to the subprime, right, as a fire that started in subprime mortgages and then wrecked the market. So it's a great point that, that um, when we see hidden baselines, we're often seeing that regulation exists. Another critical legal tool, flipping our assumptions about a position. So similar, he would say liberals would do well to consider, reconsider their anti-market rhetoric. They're not anti-market. They're actually, um, they want open markets, right? They want chances for more ownership in the market. They want a more egalitarian distribution of ownership or equality in the market. That's not anti-market. And here, another example uh, is something that Todd picked up on that I also found very striking. Um, he recalls very effectively a feudal baseline and says, classical liberals were not fighting for anarchy, right? They're not fighting for no government. They're actually fighting against feudalism and slavery. And when we see that they're writing rules against caste and status dependence, then we can understand that modern liberals are doing something similar when they fight for rules that are against classifications by race or by sex or by sexual orientation. So it's a great, it's a great move to um, kind of flip our ideas about what the argument is. Third technique. Considering layered default rules, sometimes this is done over time by critical legal or legal realist thinkers um, who would say any particular legal doctrine is based on um, centuries of accumulated rules and state interventions. Um, and uh, and he, Joe does it with uh, consumer protection law, which as he points out is uh, every state has a consumer protection law. Uh, and what those laws do is simply enforce a set of provisions that um, mean that not everything is up for grabs when you buy or sell something. So what consumer protection does is set up a package of conditions so that we don't have to renegotiate every time everything, quality expectations, enforcement options, modes of payment, environmental standards, um, labor standards. As the owner of a VW diesel, <laughs> I'm particularly sensitive to this point, and I, I thought I didn't have to negotiate, right, environmental standards. Um, but as he points out, the same argument obviously applies to the mortgage market. So we shouldn't have to renegotiate everything um, each time we come into the market. That would be uh, a disabling uh, system. The substantive lesson, I think, is one that the, where the panelists, uh, the panelists actually agree with Joe, which is to say it's not a question of regulation versus no regulation or law versus no law, but it's a question of what's the right kind of law, what's the right kind of regulation that we need. Um, I would go on about this with money if I had a chance, but I don't want to take too much time, so I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to go on uh, because. Once you see that, that it's a question of what kind of regulation, then you get to Joe's second major accomplishment. And I think this is actually an answer to John, although I let Joe answer John. But John says, you know, so how do we know how, you know, what regulation is good and what regulation isn't good? And, and Joe's book offers a new political theory on that. So Joe, in his, you know, when he stops being a little realist, he's actually thinking as a political theorist. Um, and he, he, the, the step is, once we see that it's not regulation versus non-regulation, but what kind of regulation, we realize, he realizes, he argues, we need a normative theory. So we need a political theory to sort out good from bad regulation. And he gives us a political theory. And the political theory is something that he encapsulates under the term democratic liberty. 
So uh, democratic liberty is a, a phrase that encapsulates a new paradigm that he's trying to entrench. So if he can shove the regulation versus the market out of the way and entrench instead uh, an argument about democratic liberty and what it entailed or what it should entail, then the idea, as I read it, is, is we would move the discussion forward. So the, the democratic liberty, in a nutshell, uh, endorses liberty as a common goal, which immediately kind of gets us to think differently already about conservatives and liberals. It then re-entrenches or joins to liberty the democratic postulate. So that we're not thinking libertarian or anarchy when we think about liberty, but instead we understand that we can't have laws that allow subprime relations. We can't um, have laws. So for example, when we enter the debate about whether there can be a sign that says whites only, on a, public, um, on a public store, we understand that, uh, yeah, we could flip the baseline. We could do the critical flip and say, well, that's about right to association. It's not about excluding someone of a different uh, race. And Joe says, no, the, when we get normative, we have to take that on and answer it straightforward and say, we live in a democratic marketplace, one that has committed itself to the inclusion of people of all colors and all races, and therefore the whites only sign fails. This is not the kind of um, behavior we can accept, so we have to actually have a law or a regulation against it. Third thing, so we have liberty, but democratic liberty, and as part of that, and really interestingly, Joe um, endorses and identifies democratic society as having widely dispersed ownership. So the third kind of element of democratic liberty is widely dispersed ownership is a key principle. And this postulate, if you think about it, gives equality a primary place. Part of this book is written for Piketty and for the issues that Piketty was targeting of inequality in our society. And it returns us again, here he uses the feudalism theme. The idea is, um, that, uh, contra contra the, um, that in contrast to feudalism, liberty and property should be enabling. They should be enabling and, and equalizing. Free ownership societies are something we have to develop. They don't just appear once we get rid of feudalism. Uh, so this is a very inclusive vision. It, uh, its point is to show that liberals and conservatives have common ground, thus the optimism that John was trying to get to. <laughs> Uh, it shows that both of these groups are moving away from feudal baselines or for, from worlds in which slavery was accepted. So it frames the debate very deliberately so that we can work from there. And I found it a very powerful vision. So the questions from those accomplishments. My first question is, why the resilience of the myth? Uh, why the resilience of the regulation versus market myth? And another version of this is, you know, why is it so easy to forget that property rights are not about individual entitlements only, but they're about individual entitlements that, um, that also accommodate other people's entitlements? Says, why do we forget about the larger frame that a fire can go across our property and onto somebody else's property? Um, I feel this question, I mean, this is a, the, the target, regulation versus the market, or law versus the market, government versus the market, in the case of money and monetary relations, where money is imagined as something that's uh, outside the market, and Locke actually writes it as before political society, when it turns out money's made by political society. Why the resilience of this myth? So Joe, one of Joe's answers is, I was reading for this, so I want him to answer, um, because I don't think the book was actually, the book's meant to take down the myth, but not to tell us where it c came from. So my assignment for Joe for the next book is to tell us why the resilience of this myth. Part of the answer in his book is, you know, it's a matter of intellectual history. Um, Locke and Hobbes are read as classical liberals, but there's got to be more, because while we're influenced by our uh, intellectual forebears, we, we set aside all sorts of intellectual history. We set aside political theory that we've inherited. We're not drawing here on Jefferson or on William Jennings Bryan. I mean, there's some reason why these, why this myth survives, and I would love to hear Joe take that on, because I'm very curious about it. The, the second and last question I have is, where will the new theory, that is this idea of democratic liberty, take us? So, um, so a couple of, of examples. Can the theory democratic liberty take us to 
just wages for workers who made the products that are in the marketplace. So I'm thinking consumer protection, right? Consumer protection includes environmental regulation, it includes um, quality standard, standards, it includes payment options. Can it also include just standards for the workers who made the product as, um, you know, based on the rationale that all participants in the market have a common interest in, um, sorry, in, in mutual welfare, or even more specifically, that, uh, that consumer and consumption will only survive in a marketplace in which there's enough distribution of proceeds so that the market can continue, right? A sort of Keynesian rationale. Uh, can we get there from the idea of democratic liberty? Second question, can we redefine ownership from the idea of democratic liberty? So in the talk about ownership, we found that Joe is, we find that Joe is a liberal, not a socialist. He talks about private property. Uh, he doesn't talk about common property nearly as much. Um, although he does talk about the rights of renters. So my question was, reading this, can, is the, are the rights of renters the camel's nose under the tent? So using legal realist techniques, we could say, um, when we grant more and more robust rights to tenants, we're actually redefining the ownership, what it means to be a landlord, what it means to own property. Um, and in fact, this I'm just stealing this from Joe. Joe does all this work in his fourth chapter, and I'm just kind of pushing him to say, so have we really redefined ownership? Um, to take another question from Joe, here's, a, here's the type of move that I'm pushing him on. He tells the story about Filene's headquarters, the big old Filene's department store in downtown Crossing, which predate some of your birth, but <laughs> I remember. When it was shut down, it was demolished, and the owner left it there for years. So it was just a, um, a blank space, a crater in the middle of an aging downtown. And it economically depressed the downtown. And the question is, you know, did the owner have the right to leave it unused? Or, or was the owner actually externalizing blight and harm on the neighboring um, buildings and driving down their economic possibilities, did the city then have a right to take it by eminent domain for the good of the whole city? So if we allow the possibility of the latter, then we really are redefining ownership. And, um, and the question is, how far can that be expanded? So is MERS, the MERS, the system of, re of recording and transferring mortgages that made securitization possible, is that acceptable in a democratic society, or should there really be public ownership and a public system um, that would displace that system? To take it a step further, banks create a public resource, which is money. Anybody wants to talk about how they do that? <laughs> I'm happy afterwards. But uh, is the fact that they're actually creating and dispensing a public resource something that means bank, we should think about banks and the possibility that they be publicly owned as opposed to privately owned. So you can see where I'm going. As students of Joe's, we can use the techniques that he's giving us to ask him to elucidate and to build and develop his version and his vision of democratic liberty and see how far it would go. Thanks. So I uh, join everyone else in saying uh, that I'm really uh, grateful for the opportunity to uh, celebrate this book. Um, and celebrate Joe, I have to say uh, one, uh, so I'm not going to say other things, the things other people have said, uh, and I will try to speak into the microphone. Um, uh, one thing I'd like to add to uh, what people have said is uh, that this book is definitely in Joe's voice. Uh, one uh, salient feature of it is the uh, sincerity and goodwill uh, with which it's uh, written, uh, which is completely consistent with the message, which is uh, that there's more that uh, unites people than they realize. Uh, and with that basic proposition, I'm uh, uh, very much in agreement. I think there is uh, a lot more that unites people than people realize. Uh, but in order to be provocative, uh, let me suggest that conflict is good sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and what I mean by that is that, um, uh, is that there's sort of a flip side to the picture that Joe is, uh, is painting here. And um, to extend, if we extend this idea outward, so what next, uh, we have to face up to uh, the flip side. And the flip side is of the idea that agreement is good is, well, I guess that agreement is bad. Um, and, not, and I'm not, I'm saying that as a sort of provocative statement. I don't think agreement is always bad, but what I do mean very specifically 
is that I don't think in the current situation the greatest danger to us is from pure philosophies, uh, you know, pure liberalism, pure classical liberalism, pure libertarianism. Instead, I think the greatest danger is uh, uh, stems from certain kinds of agreement that people have. Uh, and in particular, I'm thinking of uh, a trend toward, which I do think we have, towards crony capitalism. Uh, so the blend, uh, there are many fine blends of government and business and unions and so forth, but uh, it's always a problem when people cooperate, uh, that they cooperate really for the, the common good. Uh, and that's not guaranteed. And we have to always face up to uh, that problem. Uh, and sometimes, and I'm not saying always, sometimes a combination of, say, government and business can be worse than an emphasis on government or markets. Uh, now, this is all a matter of more or less, but certain combinations can be very productive, but they can also be uh, very problematic. Which means that it's, I think, a little bit quick to say that regulation always means the rule of law. Uh, crony capitalism is not the rule of law. Crony capitalism is insiderism, it's uh, politics uh, in the sort of will to power sense, uh, and not uh, the sort of sane deliberation that characterizes this book. So I take this book as a model, but uh, agreement doesn't always lead to the kind of sane deliberation that this book instantiates. So I'm going to uh, talk about three things, uh, maybe three things. Uh, the financial crisis, uh, regulation in general, and property. Um, and the theme here is that uh, we have to keep our eye on the sort of public-private aspect to this, the sort of combined public-private aspect. So to take the financial crisis, the causes of the financial crisis are very uh, you know, complex and multiple. But to some extent, they stemmed from a, a bad combination of public and private. Um, uh, I, I subscribe to the view of uh, Rajan and Zagalis in their book, Fault Lines, that there's long been a consensus, a sort of tacit and sometimes explicit consensus, to paper over inequality through encouraging people to take on debt, public and private, uh, and that that fueled uh, some of the bubble. Uh, it was a banking crisis and a housing crisis, and uh, bubbles don't come out of nowhere. Uh, and there were plenty of government policies, and I'm not singling out any given one out for the ma majority of the blame, that pumped up the bubble. Uh, the bubble was very important in terms of people's sloppiness uh, uh, across the board. You don't have to worry about sloppiness or what would happen if things, uh, if the bubble burst, if you're not thinking about the bubble bursting. And if we look across countries, there are, is a surprising fact about human psychology that people will say, oh, this is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way it's going to be. And they don't realize that they're in the middle of a bubble. Or if they do, they can't really so short sell because they don't know when it's going to burst. The whole phenomenon of too big to fail goes all the way back at least to continental Illinois in 1984. Big part of it. Fannie and Freddie, public-private, uh, and th they were stood ready to buy a lot of this uh, horrible stuff uh, that was out there. They were really egging the, the market on. Uh, the regulatory structure encouraged these fictional uh, ratings by the agency, aiding, agencies. And so when we get to the complex financial uh, products that uh, Joe's talking about and the fraud and so forth, which did occur, we're talking about something that amounts to gas on a fire that's already uh, underway. Uh, as far as regulation goes, we could talk a long time about what regulation was uh, contributing. One, I think, uh, was that bank regulation in terms of management of banks versus their shareholders uh, was in a sorry state. Uh, but bubble, you know, the bubble basically was a public-private partnership uh, uh, and one not to be proud of. The irony is that Dodd-Frank in many ways reinforces some of that public-private uh, partnership. It promotes big banks at the expense of small banks. Small banks are going out of business uh, left and right. Uh, it entrenches too big to fail. Uh, systemically important means, in a cynic's view, too big to fail. Uh, and, it, and that's just a, it, it's a problem. Why is it a problem? Because there's a demand for culinary capitalism. Uh, and uh, that's not going to change uh, probably overnight. That brings us to regulation. Sometimes wholesale deregulation, and I mean wholesale not in terms of getting rid of the rule of law, but sometimes big deregulation is appropriate. You could call the elimination of Jim Crow deregulation. You could call the elimination of eugenic uh, laws deregulation. You could call trucking deregulation the Carter administration deregulation, and it certainly, that's what people called it, uh, and it made things like Amazon possible. You, land use regulation is a fine thing and for many of the reasons Joe says, but it also is causing, according to some people, with econ uh, economic uh, um, empirics uh, 
suggesting it, that there's a big migration of poor people to places where housing is not as expensive. So there's zoning and there's zoning. Uh, and co by coastal zoning is, uh, or other land use regulations, is constraining the, the supply of housing. So people move to where the cheap housing is. Uh, and uh, so you get high skilled workers clustering in places with high housing costs. Uh, and that's a debate we should be having, but it's not really a regulation versus no regulation debate. Um, more serious, uh, well, that's very serious, uh, uh, sort of more generally, I should say, uh, the capitalist uh, sort of administrative welfare state, sort of crony capitalist administrative welfare state, uh, aims at, uh, among other things, and I say among other things, cartelization, incumbent protection, and basically creating a status society. Uh, so it looks a little futile to me uh, from where I stand. <laughs> Why do we have this? Again, it, there's a demand for it. Uh, and in particular, uh, what we really have to keep out, an eye out for is what some people call a bootlegger and Baptist coalition. So the, when you go back to, we don't really have this much anymore, but laws that restrict people from selling alcohol, particularly on Sundays, I guess we have it before noon here, but uh, so it's a vestige. But the idea is that uh, the Baptists were all for it because they didn't like alcohol, and the bootleggers were for it because they wanted to raise up prices. Um, and, and bootleggers and Baptists are a very powerful coalition. Um, finally, on property, I think there's much, uh, I agree with, uh, with Joe here, but I think I put a little bit more of a, a cast on um, worrying about the public-private combinations here. Um, I, I don't think we're going to get rid of bubbles altogether. Uh, there's just too much uh, human psychology behind it. Uh, so I think he's right to worry about how robust our system is to bubbles. Um, I would, though, say that some of the things he wants to fix are probably not things that caused the crisis. So the um, non-standardized financial packages, I think, made people freak out more than they would have otherwise. Uh, but I'm not sure that that caused the. But it's very important to uh, think of these in uh, property terms. Even MERS, MERS was actually a more public-private than it looks at first. Fannie and Freddie uh, and Ginnie Mae, the uh, sort of public-private, either private but publicly sponsored. Uh, uh, entities really got the ball rolling in 1993 uh, and teamed up then with the Mortgage Bankers Association. And I would call MERS a, a symptom of the problem. Uh, the, the recording system is pretty creaky, and unless we want to say that um, securitization should be off the table altogether, the, our system compared to systems in uh, other countries uh, is actually a very creaky uh, system of land records. And we have to address that, and actually Joe talks about some of the possibilities for doing that, but I'm a little bit less sanguine about the the sort of background to MERS, I think, is a symptom of a problem. I don't think that it should be purely private. The transparency issue is huge, uh, but I don't. I think we are going to move to some, something more electronic uh, along the lines of MERS without the lack of transparency. Generally, I think um, uh, what, what I think I like about this book is that it opens up uh, a whole raft of discussions we could have, and I think that it's something that Joe's been obviously thinking about in recent years about what the, the right combination of rules and standards is and so forth in order to prevent uh, people from exploiting the system for the well-heeled to be able to make their arguments in an effective uh, way that really goes beyond what we uh, consider legitimate. Uh, and so I, I really applaud the idea of beginning this conversation. Uh, I don't think it's a really a public versus private or a liberal versus libertarian thing completely. I think we really should pay attention to um, problems that we really have to solve. And I think there are a lot of tools, uh, constructive fraud, unconscionability, and so forth, that can get at them. And public regulation, yes, I will say it, um, to, uh, to address these problems. But we have to realize that these are knives with two edges. Uh, and, the, and the crony capitalist trend that we see these days is no, uh, I think is no fiction. Uh, and we have to really worry about our agreement leading uh, down that uh, primrose path. So thank you again for the book and for the chance. <laughs> five minutes. Five minutes. Um, You're the residual claimant. I, so uh, <clears throat> maybe just uh, I'll clarify again. I'm not saying I like all regulations. There's a lot of regulations that I think are terrible, right? That it's just that the choice is not to have it or not to have it. So I completely agree with um, uh, Henry about that, and and also um, uh, Todd and John that. Um, you know, if you're going to make a distinction between law and regulation based on whether the regulations are good or bad, or whether they promote the freedoms we want or not, that's exactly what I want the discussion to be about. I want us to talk about the normative um, framework of our life together in a democratic society where we have freedom to pursue happiness and where each person 
is given equal concern and respect, and we also elect our leaders, and we um, uh, do things uh, uh, democratically rather than having uh, a dictator or having the head of the American Economic Association being the, you know, the king or something like that. Uh, um, so I'm, that's what I want, is to have a discussion about what's the shape of regulation that works. Um, I'm in favor of deregulation also. I mean, the, the, the problem is that the word regulation, deregulation, um, you know, are, are uh, confusing. And, you know, when you get rid of feudalism, you're regulating because you're dis redistributing property rights from lords to peasants. Um, and that's a regulation. But you're also deregulation, deregulating because you're freeing the peasants from being slaves of the lord. So, there, you know, there, there's... Um, I don't, I don't, uh, when someone says I want to regulate or deregulate, I actually are not, I'm not quite clear what they're talking about because I think these things go both ways. Uh, one thing I thought I'd say to um, Chris, because I uh, thought about this, that there was a law passed in Oregon called Measure 37, which basically said no new zoning laws, environmental laws, and discrimination laws, no new laws can possibly be passed if they reduce the value of your property by a penny. <laughs> and if a new law reduces the value of your property at all, you, it can't be enforced without compensation. And people voted for this. It had a bizarre aspect to it where they said, your property, um, they, they said, we can't impose new regulations on your property. They defined your property as property owned by you, your mother or father, or their parents. <laughs> So then you had a street, and on the street, it would be like my property was governed by the zoning law of 1960, because that's when I moved in. John had no zoning law at all, because his grandfather was there in 1890, and there was no zoning law in 1890, and every one of us had a different zoning law. And what happened was that all of a sudden, um, because there was no zoning on John's property, he starts putting in a funeral home right next to my house. Um, people began to realize that they liked zoning law because zoning law, um, people were thinking zoning, zoning law doesn't let me do what I want on my own land. And so they were thinking like a two-year-old, like this is, I want to do it. I really want to do it. And they weren't thinking that zoning law means that he can't do what he wants on his land. They didn't see that deregulation of his land would hurt my property rights. So they were thinking about one side of the equation. Um, and when they realized what was happening, they got rid of Measure 37. Not completely, but for the most part. I sort of think we need to um, remind people about the golden rule. I think we need to have a little closer connection between what people learn in church and synagogue about taking care of other people and paying attention to other people and you know every person being created in the image of God and irreplaceable um, and think about that as much as they think about doing whatever they want and I think a legal system that treats everyone with equal concern and respect um, means that we have to think as much about other people as we think about ourselves and I think that's what law is about law is setting up minimum standards for society that um, believes in individual liberty, where people get to live their lives and pursue happiness, where each of us has equal status, where when we go to a hotel, we don't have to worry about being excluded because of our race. Um, uh, more than half the states allow discrimination based on sexual orientation right now, um, and only about 20 states prohibit it. Uh, we're seeing what that means for people. Uh, um, uh, having to um, call ahead to see whether they're welcome, that kind of thing. So I, I just, I think a little bit of golden rule thinking w would actually help us. Do you want to take one or two questions? <laughs> what, you, 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 whatever, whatever you want. What's the, uh, uh, can we go for a couple of minutes? Or, yeah, yeah. Two or three questions. In New York uh, City, the taxes on a package of cigarettes are $8.50, and there's also a 
law forbidding the sale of single cigarettes. As a result, a lot of lower income people sell cigarettes on the corners. Recently, a man named Eric Garner was approached by the police, ended up being killed for the crime of selling single cigarettes and for resisting arrest. Uh, isn't it inherent that regulators, and I'm not denying that we all need some regulations, but isn't it almost inherent that regulators are what you might call the regulator class always becomes very zealous and always ends up into over-regulation? I'm a law professor, and I say it depends, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what the alternative is, right? If the, in my book, I didn't, I'm not, you're going to say that uh, people in government can't be trusted, but what, people in business can be trusted? Private people can be trusted? I mean, that people are good and bad, regulators are good and bad, police are good and bad. Uh, you know, to make a blanket statement about all government employees are bad is to me just wrong. But you have the choice of not doing business with the business. You don't really have the You choice don't have the choice of not doing business with business. You need food, you need clothing, you need shelter. You don't have the choice of not doing business with business. I'm sorry. Well, you can choose your businesses that you do business with, right? Uh, could you elaborate on the third chapter where it goes how consumer protection laws promote free markets? The idea that I found particularly uh, curious in your book. Could you elaborate how they help us um, in a way that protects from deceptive and unfair practices? My argument is building on an argument that libertarians make. Um, libertarians don't want regulation, but libertarians want laws against fraud. So if you ask academic libertarians what they think government should do, they say it should protect us from force and fraud. Why are libertarians against fraud? Because if you and I make an arrangement, a contract, we come to an understanding about what the arrangement is. If I lie to you in the course of that um, negotiation, if I tell you I'm selling you a Stradivarius violin when I know it's not a Stradivarius violin, I'm stealing your money. It's not a voluntary agreement. It's actually a taking of a property rights. So it's a form of theft. Um, and consumer protection laws protect people from unfair and deceptive practices. And so my understanding of them is that they, they prevent a kind of fraud. And they ensure that when people enter into a, a relationship that both parties are getting more or less what they think they're supposed to be getting rather than one person cheating the other one. It's actually a libertarian principle. And it's actually... Consumer protection laws is that when you buy a car, it's supposed to work, it's supposed to be safe. Uh, there's a law in Massachusetts called the Lemon Law. If there's a certain amount of repair costs within the first year if you buy the car, you can give it back because you're supposed to be buying a car that actually works rather than one that doesn't work. So I think that it actually promotes the expectations of both parties. And if the car seller has the expectation they're selling a car which isn't going to work, that expectation is unreasonable. And they know that's not what the consumer expects. And so I think the consumer protection laws actually promote having the parties get what they want when they enter the marketplace. Thank you, Professor Singer. And our, our panel, let's all give them a